Hello everybody, my name is John Brueger and I'm your faculty mentor for Torts 1 at California Southern University School of Law. I want to apologize ahead of time because I intended to record a video introducing you to the topics of Torts 1 and to myself as your faculty mentor. Um, I'm having a little computer issues so I will try to get a video posted uh, shortly but in the meantime I wanted to create this PowerPoint slide to introduce you to me and to the concept of torts one. So I want to start off by asking what is torts? Uh, torts is one of the fundamental areas of law that you learn as a 1L student. Uh, typically uh, also included in that list is contracts law and civil procedure. So in this class uh, we are going to be studying the law of torts. Uh, this is a two semester class so in this class we will be studying the first half of it and the second half of the class will be in torts two. One way that you can think about torts is that it is the civil justice system's answer to criminal law. So in the criminal system if you kill someone uh, the courts will hold you accountable for murder. In a civil law system, if you kill someone, uh, you can be sued for wrongful death. Um, and also you can be charged with murder in the criminal law system. Those two things are not mutually exclusive and they can both occur. Uh, similarly, if you steal from someone, criminal law pu punishes you for theft, but civil law will hold you liable for something called conversion. So the tort system is a means to restore the balance of justice over a wrong that was committed by one person or business or other entity against another. Unlike criminal law, there may not be a requirement of intentionality in torts. In other words, uh, in criminal law, the defendant must have uh, requisite criminal intent, the mens rea, to commit a criminal act. In the tort system, uh, there are things called intentional torts that require a certain level of intent, but for others, including uh, negligence, there is no intent to commit harm required, just a negligent act. And you're probably most uh, familiar with the tort system as I was before I went to law school. Uh, if you've ever had a car, in, a car accident, a personal injury, a uh, slip and fall, a lot of the lawyers that you see advertising on daytime television uh, are looking to represent plaintiffs who've been injured. These are all tort claims in which the lawyer will sue the defendant based on the tort act, usually negligence, and the defendant is liable for the damages that you incurred. So in torts one, we will be focusing on three main topics, uh, intentional torts, privileges and defenses to those torts, and then we will start talking about negligence. We will not, we will not complete negligence this term that will be picked up again in torts two. For intentional torts, we will be looking at assault, battery, false imprisonment, intentional infliction of emotional distress, trespass to land and to chattels, and conversion in tort. Each one of these specific tort actions has a set of necessary and sufficient conditions required in order to make the case. For example, assault in the tort system is legally defined as the attempt to make harmful or offensive contact with another person, which places the victim in reasonable apprehension for his or her physical safety. And such apprehension means the victim reasonably fears for his or her physical safety or has anxiety in anticipation of being struck by unconsented, harmful or distasteful contact. And four, there is a threat of imminent contact. And as you will read, the most important part of learning these causes of action will be in learning these elements to each different tort. Essentially all of the torts are going to have a list of uh, specific factors that play into each tort like I've listed here with assault. Uh, one issue to point out now is that you will see some crossover between uh, torts and criminal law as regards the definition of battery and assault. Um, Assault in the tort system is defined as, uh, you could call it an attempted battery. Battery is actually making contact with someone, hurting someone, um, and that's what criminal law would call assault. In the tort system, assault is the attempt to commit the battery. You uh, give the person a reasonable apprehension that you're going to hurt them, um, and but you don't actually 
commit the harm or make contact. In addition to the intentional torts, we'll be learning about the privileges which act as a defense to each of the intentional torts. And these privileges will include consent, self-defense, defense of others, defense of property, the right to re-enter, right to recapture, necessity, and the authority of law. And as with all the tort causes of action, each of the defenses will have its own set of necessary and sufficient elements that must be shown in order to prove up that defense. Finally, we'll start talking about negligence which does not require intentional conduct by the tortfeasor. The tortfeasor is the person who is committing the tort. Uh, so the, ele the elements of negligence are duty, there has to exist a duty that the other person owes to you, duty to safely operate their vehicle, a duty to keep you from harm, to make a premises safe, things like that. So there has to exist a duty. If there's no duty, there's no negligence. Then there has to be a breach of that duty. Once the court finds that there has there is a legal duty that the person owes to you, then the court will have to find that there has been a breach of that duty by some sort of conduct. Then we will look at something called approximate causation or causation in fact, and that is that the breach, the duty exists, that there is a breach of the duty, and that the breach of the duty has in fact caused your damages. Sometimes the, you see issues in this crop up where there is a, uh, a lot of intervening factors between one person's conduct and another person's harm and whether that was actually the cause and fact or whether it was some sort of intervening cause that was the cause and fact. Next we'll talk about legal causation. And legal causation is uh, whether the law has recognized that the proximate causation between the duty, breach of duty and damages is a recognizable causation. Uh, legal causation will get into issues of privilege and immunity. And then damages. The Every negligence action has to have some sort of measure of damages and this is usually in uh, what you see in car accident cases will be uh, lost wages from the person who was injured and couldn't work, medical bills, um, and a possible present and future disability. So each of these concepts is rich with information, so we'll only be looking at the standard of care, causation in fact, and proximate cause in torts one. The rest of the issues will be dealt with in torts two as well as some other issues. We will also be looking at the concept of res ipsa loquitur. Res ipsa loquitur is a legal doctrine where the harm caused by the tortfeasor uh, is unknown to the victim. Uh, the victim no doesn't know exactly what the negligent act was that caused the harm, but the courts have held that this type of harm in this fact pattern is such that the harm would not have occurred but for a negligent act on the part of the tortfeasor, although we don't know exactly what the negligent act would be. Um, and again, in torts 2, we'll look at the rest of the elements of negligence, and we'll look at some more complex issues in torts, such as strict liability, ultra-hazardous activity, products liability, defamation, fraud, and some others. So during this 16-week semester, you will have 46 assignments that are due, which include readings, writing assignments, lectures, FINS exercises, Cali exercises, case briefs, and exams. These are all new concepts to you as a new 1L student, so it is going to seem like an overwhelming amount of work to learn the new jargon, understand the concepts, and complete the exercises. But don't worry, that's why I'm here as the faculty mentor. I've been through this material numerous, numerous times, and I am here to help you understand it every way I can until you get it. Uh, my goal, like I said at the beginning, is I'll be posting weekly videos to discuss concepts for that week. Uh, hopefully I can get the videos to start working and I can figure it out and we will have some videos posted and I'm available anytime for additional help. Email me, call me. Uh, probably the best route would be to email me to set up a time to talk so I can devote some time where it's quiet and we can have a conversation if you're struggling with an issue. This is my contact information. I am based in St. Louis, Missouri which is on the central time zone. So please bear that in mind if you should need to call me. I'm two hours uh, ahead of you. 
my email is john.bruger at my.calsouthern.edu. Please email me at that address if you have a reason to email me. Also, when emailing me, please use your My Cal Southern email address so that we can keep track of our correspondence appropriately. And my cell is 618-558-5328. I'm a, a bit pathologically addicted to my iPhone. So if you need to reach me, I'm us- I usually have my phone. I get my email and my calls and messages all on my phone. So feel free to contact me anytime. I should get it r- pretty quickly. My goal is to respond to all your messages within four hours. If you do not have a response within four hours, please email me or call me to follow up.